yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers. Anybody can get church How about that? Okay. So, all right, today we're going to talk about Snowflake. Uh, again, we're, we're following along on the reading the papers about these, these individual uh, OLAP systems that build upon the things we talked about uh, this semester. For a uh, quick overview of what's, what's coming up to finish up the semester. So project two, the final, the final submission will be uh, in two weeks on May 1st. Again, I will send feedback later this week on everyone's uh, preliminary submissions. Project three, the final presentation will be on Friday, May 5th at 5.30 p.m. I think there's a room we can either go there. I don't know. I think it's a big room. Or we can just come here. We'll figure it out, and we'll get pizza and whatever, whatever else people want to eat. Um, next class, Mark from CWI will be giving a guest lecture about DuckDB. Uh, I decided let's just all come here and meet up, and then we'll watch the Zoom thing. And that way, like, we, it'll be interactive. We can ask questions, and not us, like, everyone muting themselves, sitting on Zoom. And then next week, also, too, Ippocratus uh, will be giving a guest lecture in the uh, same thing over Zoom about, about Redshift. Um, and I don't think that I didn't assign the Redshift paper to read for that class. Um, so there is one uh, that's better than the Snowflake one, but it, he'll, he'll cover all the main details. Okay? All right, any questions about these, these many things? Okay. So let's jump into our discussion for today. Who is giving guest lectures 4.5? It's going to be Snowflake. Okay. I've already talked to Charlie. It's not on the website. There, what's that? Yeah, the, the Snowflake's getting back to me about the name of the person. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, we've covered you know, this sort of this this story about what databases look like or o OLAP databases look like in industry and the open source community. Uh, we, we covered this at the beginning of the semester. We've been talking a little bit about giving when we talk about the background of Dremel, the background of of um, uh, you know, uh, the system we talked about last time, which I'm drawing a blank on, stupidly. Uh, oh, D Spark, Databricks, sorry. So we talked a little bit, look at what, what, was, what was going on in the, in, the, in the world again. And this is sort of reiterating this um, to understand what the, you know, why sort of Snowflake appeared when it did and, and how it did. Um, that it just wasn't this, like, people magically thought, oh, we're going to build this. Like, there was clearly things going on, and people put the pieces together. And decided what the you know came up with the architecture of Snowflake. So again, in the 2000s was when we started seeing these special purpose database systems, relational database systems, that were designed specifically for for OLAP workloads. Vertica, this is okay. Yeah, you you everyone is closer. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we'll cut that. All right. So Vertica was probably the, was probably the most famous one. Uh, again, that was uh, Mike Stonebreaker's work with, with Sam Madden and Mike Stan Zonic with the fork of, of Postgres, rewritten from scratch would be Columnar. Green Plum is the other one that's probably the most famous of these. That also was a fork of Postgres. MonadDB was the, at a CWI where, where DuckDB came from or comes from. Um, Vectorwise was the optimized version of, of, uh, of MonadDB which was the precursor of Snowflake and also sort of the precursor to, uh, C sorry, precursor to Snowflake and precursor to, to DuckDB. Uh, and then Par Excel was a parallel version of, um, of, of Postgres. So again, there was a bunch of these uh, columnar OLAP systems that were, that were around at the time. Um, at the same, you know, there was also this, this work on building on top of Hadoop to add support for SQL. Uh, to run on either you know, Hadoop jobs as MapReduce or reading data from HDFS. Hive and Presto are probably the two most famous ones. Presto got forked. Presto came out of Facebook. It got forked into two different versions. There was Presto DB and Presto SQL. Presto SQL got renamed to Trino, and then Presto, Presto DB still is, still is around. Impala we covered last class. Stinger was, Horton, was sort of Hortonworks version of Impala, like SQL on top of, again, Hadoop stuff. But all of these systems, have a lot of the, the sort of early variants, early ideas that we've been talking about this semester, mostly in the columnar storage, uh, vectorized execution, mostly for the ones uh, up here. Um, later on, these other ones added it. But the, the big thing about them, all of them, is that they were 
they weren't being sold or provided as, as a service. And instead, the, you had to download them, run them on-prem, and manage everything yourself. Because right? that's the way people had, had been selling and uh, selling database system software for, for decades, right? And obviously, the cloud cha changes all of this. But again, this is late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, the mindset that like immediately, oh, of course there should be a cloud service, wasn't automatic for everyone the way it is now. So the big changes that came out uh, in the early 2010s was uh, the general paper we talked about before. It came out in 2011. Uh, Facebook started building Presto internally in 2012. Again, building, building on top of their experience of creating, creating Hive, which converted SQL queries into MapReduce jobs, and building a specialized engine similar to Dremel. Amazon bought a license to Par Excel in 2011, uh, and then they released Redshift as a service in AWS in 2013, which actually beat, Red, uh, beat, uh, beat Snowflake. Um, Par Excel, the company was kind of like, I think it was dead at this point, uh, or they were, trying to sh they were trying to sell it off. Uh, and they were hoping Amazon was going to buy them, but Amazon only ended up buying a license of the software. Um, so while this is all going on, uh, there was a bunch of VCs at a VC firm called Sutter Hill, which is probably not really well known, not, not like Andreessen Horowitz or Greylock or Excel, a bunch, bunch of the other ones, right? But their game is that they don't, you don't come and pitch them like, hey, this is what I want to do, give me money. They're instead, they're like, uh, they're like a, like a record label putting together a boy band where they find people like, okay, these guys seem smart. Let's put them together, and they're going to build what we want them to build. Like that, that's their operating model. So rather than, again, pitching random people or people coming and pitching to them, they say, this is what we want to build. Who's going to help us build it? And, they, and they, they use their own money. Like you go to their website. There's nothing there. This is literally just a logo. Last time I checked. It doesn't say anything about what, what they're doing. Um, so they recruited two top engineers working on, on Oracle's database system, uh, these two French guys here. And then they had the guy that built Vectorwise uh, at a CWI, the, you know, the, or the you know, MoDB X100 stuff we talked about before, uh, Marcin and Zakowski. They got them together and said, hey, let's go build a, a Vectorwise cloud service using a lot of the ideas that they developed at Oracle and, and at Vectorwise. And that became came Snowflake. So that's the background here. It wasn't like someone clearly saw, sorry, it wasn't like the founder saw, like, OK, this is exactly what Snowflake is going to be. My understanding is that this VC firm recruited them and said, okay, this is what you guys are going to end up building. And they gave them a lot of money and, and then set them off, and obviously it was, it was super successful. Um, and so successful, uh, one of the co-founders actually has a snowflake tattoo on his leg. Uh, I mean, to me, that's a dedication for your database, right? That you're willing to, like, I mean, yeah, it's, they went IPO, so it's a life-changing amount of money. But uh, that's dedication. You love your database so much, you, give, you, give yourself a, you get a tattoo of it, right? I hope to get there one day. Then all the students get, can get tattoos. OK. So what is Snowflake? So Snowflake is a managed OLAP database system written in C++. Uh, I don't know if it's public that it's C++, but I've been telling you it is. And it's a shared disk architecture, like we've talked about for all these other systems. And the one thing that they're going to do slightly different is, or they're very explicit about, is that they're going to do a, aggressive uh, sort of compute side caching of, of files. So when we read the, the Photon paper, or we read the, um, the, the Dremel paper, you know, they talk about, oh, we're going to go get things from, from S3 or your object store or whatever. And it seems like, makes it, makes it sound like every query is actually doing this. And it's unclear whether, how much they're caching they're actually doing, because they, want, their, they want, you know, want the compute nodes to be ephemeral and stateless. So in the Snowflake world, because they're not the cloud vendor itself, although you know, Databricks is not the cloud vendor either, but Though you're not you're not the cloud vendor, um, so therefore they're paying they're paying the the cost of doing all the reads to S3 to get data. So to avoid you know increasing their um, you know increasing their cost or operating cost to run queries, they're going to do as much client side caching on with locally attached disks as much as possible. And we'll see how they're going to be able to manage the uh, scaling out the compute uh, on the fly. For, you know, and without blowing away the cache every single time you add a new computer or drop a new computer node. Everything in Snowflake is going to be written from scratch. Unlike a, so much of the other systems, they're not going to rely on existing uh, code base. And, and they mentioned Hadoop and 
Hadoop in, in, in Postgres. Like I said, Vertigo is a fork of Postgres. Green, Greenplum is a fork of Postgres. Parcel is a fork of uh, Postgres. A lot of the new systems today are forks of Postgres, are using bits and pieces of Postgres. Everything's going to be written from scratch. Um, and, that, and they claim in the paper that it's going to allow them to have sort of precise control of exactly how the systems can behave and perform without bringing in sort of legacy baggage of maybe how Postgres expects things to be done. They're going to have to use their own custom SQL dialect. Uh, I haven't really looked to see what flavor it is. I think it looks more enterprise-y, so it looks, looks kind of more Oracle, Oracle-ish than Postgres-ish, um, if, if that can be a thing. And then they'll have their own you know, custom client-server network protocols. Like Everything is written from scratch. So I would say, again, a sort of disclaimer would be Snowflake sponsored this course in 2018. Uh, uh, they were very aggressive in coming and hiring senior students. And so that link there will take you to literally Ashish was sitting right here or standing right there giving a guest lecture about what Snowflake does um, you know, five years ago. And actually, last night, I had questions about Snowflake. Um, and he actually got on a call with me. This is Sunday night. I answered my questions about how, how they do you know, vectors execution for certain things. Literally, he's cooking, and he's answering my database questions. Um, so he's a good dude. All right. So a quick overview of what's everything in Snowflake. Again, these are the common, these are the things that we've talked about in a, you know, throughout the semester, and now we can apply them to actually Snowflake. Um, so of course, it's a disaggregated storage. The final resting place of the database is always going to be on, on the object store. Uh, they support AWS, Azure, and, um, and Google. But then again, they're going to use locally attached disks on their compute nodes as an ephemeral cache for both results, uh, spilling out for query results, spilling out enemy results of operators, um, and then for table scans, because they want to avoid the, the round trip costs of, of, of reading up to S3 for both monetary reasons and for performance. Push based vectorized execution. Uh, so that's different than we saw in, in Dremel and in, um, in, in Photon or Spark SQL, because they were all pool based. Right, so they're going to do that, that sort of operator fusion stuff that we talked about before. Everything is going to be done through pre compiled primitives using C templates. A big thing that, that, you know, is maybe not, it's not sort of groundbreaking, but it, it does help with a lot of things, is that they're going to separate the table data storage from the metadata storage. Um, and they'll have sort of separate services manage these things. And then in paper, they talk about how this allows them to do a bunch of optimizations that you wouldn't really sort of think about right away. Like, if now I want to drop a table, I just change the metadata, say this thing no longer exists, and then something in the background will go ahead and, and uh, and prune the data eventually from, from S3 at some later point when it expires. There's not going to be any explicit buffer pool. They will have operators be able to spill to disk, uh, either locally or then spill out to S3 as, as needed. They're going to be doing PAX columnar storage like everyone else. Now, in the case of Snowflake, I think the, the paper you guys read was, what, 2015, 2016. So they're very explicit about saying we're use, you know, how they're using their own internal proprietary uh, f file format. Later on, they add support for Parquet and I think Delta Lake um, and Iceberg will cover, cover it later on. But the way they operate versus what Dremel talked about or what Photon talked about, Spark SQL talked about is if you want to scan or query any data, you got to first load it into Snowflake and then it'll then convert it into their proprietary format. All right, and they do this because then you, you can collect some statistics. Um, you know, the, it's a single code base that's operating directly on the on, on the, their respective file format. Um, but then again, later on, they now support the open source ones. The way uh, I don't know whether how the code's implemented, whether they have different you know scan operators that operate on you know Parquet style format versus their own internal format. In the case of uh, Photon or Spark SQL, what I didn't talk about is they'll actually trans transcode any file that comes in into to Databricks' own internal format. So they have a single execution engine to be able to operate on that. I, I don't know what Snowflake does. I think they support certain merge joins. I, I, I messaged she, uh, she and I have run it back. But they do obviously support hash joins because that's the way to go. And then there will be a cascade style query optimizer with some adaptive optimizations, but I think it's less aggressive. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's less aggressive than, um, than Dremel and, and Databricks. So these are the, the, the sort of key, key topics that I, I want to discuss as we go along. 
So the high-level architecture is composed of three parts in Snowflake. So the first is there, there's the data storage. Again, that's just going to be the, the, the cloud-based object store that the vendor, the cloud vendor, is providing them. But then they're also going to have, so they're going to have this notion of a, what they call a virtual warehouse, a virtual data warehouse. Um, and again, think of this as it was the, the architecture was, was designed before data lakes were a thing. Right? So there was no idea of a lake house or data lake back in 2012, 2013. You know, Snowflake was designed to replace things like Teradata. Like people had these traditional monolithic data warehouses. And so the idea with a virtual warehouse is that you would provision some number of, of, of worker nodes or compute nodes, that well, I'll explain in the next slide, um, that, that will be able to run your queries. And you could have multiple data warehouses, or sorry, multiple virtual warehouses that could be operating on the same uh, shared disk storage, but you would have, uh, we would have sort of performance isolation between the different warehouses because they're, they're completely separate compute nodes. So originally, the idea was like you have to say, you wouldn't say, I want five nodes or six nodes or whatever. They have this notion of like you, you get a size of a virtual warehouse and it's abstracted away from some number, like 2x, 3x, 4x. Uh, and you don't know exactly the number of CPUs or how much RAM you're getting. All that's hidden away from you. And it was sort of like you, you, would, you would, if you ever turn this, if you turn the thing on, you're, you're paying for it, right? So even if you weren't running queries, if it was running, you were paying for it, similar to like EC2 model. In 2022 or 2021, they did add support for serverless deployments, but they upcharged that because uh, now you're not provisioning resources to do all the coordination stuff down here. Like you're piggybacking off of you know some some resources that are always just running. But in this case here, you only pay for like the the compute time you're actually using. Then they have what's called cloud services. And this is a hodgepodge of things. This is like the the front end layer that's going to be the the query coordinator, the scheduler. Uh, maintaining the catalog, which we'll talk about in a second, which is it can be running on FoundationDB, which is a, it's a transactional key value store that Apple bought. Um, but Snowflake was designed from the very beginning actually to use FoundationDB. Um, okay, yeah, again, we'll cover these things as we go along. All right, so the execution architecture is comprised of sort of two parts. There's the worker node. You can sort of think of that as like the single instance. Again, this is, think of, this is 2012, 2013, they're designing this. It's before Kubernetes, before Docker, right? Docker was what, 2013, 2014? Kubernetes is 2014, 2015, like a year or two later. Right? So they're running on, at the time, bare metal, bare metal instances uh, or VMs on, on Amazon. So this, is, this worker node is sort of always running uh, in, your, in your virtual data warehouse. It's going to maintain its own cache on local disk of files that, that Previous worker processes have accessed and retrieved, also potentially also intermediate results that they've generated. And they talk about how the cache doesn't need to be very, the cache replacement policy does not need to be very sophisticated. LRU is, is good enough. Uh, and you don't really need to do anything sophisticated. Now contrast that with like, when you think of like a, a buffer pool uh, policy or replacement policy where you're doing like more of sequential scans and, and, and updates and dirty writes and things like that, or dirty pages. All that you don't need for this, LRU is good enough. Like simple, simple is better. We'll cover uh, the consistent hashing up stuff in a second, but basically uh, the, the cloud services portion is gonna keep track of the metadata about what, uh, for what files I have on S3 within Snowflake to say here's, here's my tables. And then it'll use consistent hashing to assign some portion of those files to in the individual, individual worker nodes. And then when a query starts running, the, the worker node will spawn, uh, you know, do, do a fork exec, a, 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 a worker process, which is going to last for the life of the query. And this worker process can execute multiple stages or multiple uh, query plan fragments. Um, and it will communicate with other worker processes running on other worker nodes. So unlike in Dremel and in Spark SQL or, or Photon, where there was a shuffle stage, or you, you would have the worker nodes sort of can write data to different nodes, or sorry, you have the workers write data to different workers or write to a shuffle service, the workers are communicating directly with each other and sending data. Now, as I said, Snowflake is a vectorized engine. Again, it's no surprise, because again, one of the co-founders, one of the, one of the architects came from, or had built you know, vectorized as part of his uh, PhD thesis. Um, but again, it's different is that they're gonna be doing push-based. So 
there's not a lot of information on how they're actually how they're actually doing the fusion of this. Um, but basically, it's, it looks a lot like vector-wise that we talked about before, that there's templated uh, primitives for doing different, different operators and different expression evaluation. Um, and then at runtime or sort of compile time, you then fill in the different types that you have in your, in your system, and it'll generate the, the, the different variants of, of each different primitive. And then the, the query plan is essentially, when it runs, is figuring out what virtual function to call or what function to call for these different primitives to process the data uh, as, as you're running along, or as you're executing on, over data. And because you're running on, on batches or vectors, that amortizes the jump call to the different functions. So Snowflake, somebody from Snowflake gave a talk with us in, during the pandemic, 2020. They mentioned that uh, Snowflake does do cogen in limited, uh, limited ways. Um, the only ways I was able to confirm where they're actually doing this, uh, they're, they're doing LLVM style uh, compilation for the serializer and deserializer for when nodes send data to each other. So on the fly, they can cogen the something that takes the internal in-memory representation of, of, of a vector and then convert it into some byte buffer that you then send over the network. And then on the other side, they can reverse that. Again, think of this as before Arrow. Arrow was, is the way you would do this now, but they designed this at a time before Arrow. So again, they're not doing shuffle between, between stages. The worker processes push data directly to each other. They're also not supporting partial query retries. Again, this is different than Spark and different than in Dremel. And in the case of Dremel, you would have the, the workers would write to the shuffle service. Uh, if, a, if one of the workers died, the query coordinator could say, OK, this, this worker died. Let me go fire up another task, another worker, to complete those tasks that, that I'm missing. Uh, and then it would, it, would, it would pick up where, as if the worker never died at all. As far as I can tell, they're not doing, not, they can't support this. So, and I think that's a byproduct of the way they're, they're making heavy use of a local cache. Uh, like if you have a worker that's always you know, operating one pipeline after another, they're accumulating intermediate results on its local disk and not writing it to, uh, to a shared storage. If that worker dies, you may have lost you know, multiple stages of data and therefore, it just has to restart. Because again, the alternative is what? You, you could write up S3, but then Snowflake pays for that, and it's plus it's slower. So rather than do that, they'll just kill the whole query. I'm oh, sorry. All right, so they do two types of sort of rebalancing that are, that, that are worth mentioning that's, that's uh, different than, again, what we saw in, in, in Spark SQL and in uh, in Dremel. So they support the ability to, to do work stealing between the, the different nodes, or the worker, worker processes while you're running a query, similar to the way we saw work stealing with the morsels approach from Hyper. So what happens is when a query shows up, before you even start running, the optimizer has to figure out, OK, I'm, the query is accessing these tables. I know all the, the, the files that belong that, that course, or make up this table. And I'm going to use my consistent hashing scheme to decide, OK, what worker nodes are going to get, you know, operate on, the, on those files. So all that's figured out at the planning stage. Then the query starts running. And if, the, if a worker recognizes that it's processed all the files that it was required to process, um, but they haven't moved on to sort of the next pipeline, the next stage of the query plan, then they can go ask their neighbors, the other worker processes that are running for that query, and start taking files from them to start processing. And the idea here is, again, if, 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 if one, one worker is a straggler, it's for whatever reason, it's just running slower, uh, another worker can go ahead and, and steal their files to process. But the key thing they talk about in the paper is that even though the, the other worker that is, is running slow may have a copy of that file that's waiting to be processed on its local cache, and therefore, you could go ask that worker and get it and not pay the cost to go to S3, because you pay per lookup in S3. And instead, since they don't want to put more burden on that, that slower running node uh, worker, worker process, the, the one that's stealing will go, go to, down to the shared disk and steal it instead. And then the, it won't cache it locally, because it's, it, it's a, the fact that it's taking over that one worker node is temporary. Or sorry, that one file is temporary. Whereas in the consistent hashing scheme in the catalog, you need to know that if you, if you ever need to access that file again, 
this is the one worker node that should have it. So even though another worker node is going to process it, it's still being assigned uh, globally to the, the one that's running slow. And it's a slightly different approach than we saw in Dremel. In the case of Dremel, if, if you had a straggler, uh, the coordinator would figure out, okay, this thing's running slow, and then the, give, give the work to somebody else. Whereas the workers here are proactively figuring out what they should steal. The other thing they can support is what they call flexible compute. And the idea here is that if the database system recognizes that some portion of the query plan, like a pipeline, is going to be processing a large amount of data, um, and it can, the system can then decide to temporarily allow the virtual warehouse to use more worker nodes than, it, than, than the customer is actually paying for to get some additional computing capacity to make the query run faster. So this is sort of like, it's like a bookkeeping trick to allow you get more, to, to get more resources than you're actually paying for. And then, you know, assuming the resources couldn't be used for something else, then this makes you a happy customer. You know, for now for your query, it runs really, really fast, or faster than, than it otherwise would have, right, without you having to pay more, right? Now, I can't say exactly how they're actually doing this, but you can imagine, again, the original model is not serverless. You're paying for virtual warehouses, uh, and you turn them on, and even, even if you're not running queries, you're paying for them. Well, that's idle compute capacity. So I'm not saying they're borrowing it from customers that aren't using their, their nodes, but, you know. <laughs> right? And again, it's fine. Nobody knows. And you can do this because it's a managed service. All right, so let's say we have this query plan here, right? We're just doing a hash run between two tables. Uh, and, you know, this side here is going to scan a really large table, right, on, on the probe side. Also, also point out here, they have explicit nodes to do join filters. This is the sideway information passing stuff we talked about before, right? When you build the hash table, you also build a balloon filter and then can pass it over to this side of the query plan, which obviously breaks the original notion of this, this of a sort of a, a DAG model of, of query plans, but it's a, such a big win in many cases that you want to do this. So they, I think they support balloon filters, and they also support some basic range filters as well right, to, to do on the join filter side. All right, so say that this large scan is, is, is so this side of the, the query plan is, is, a, is a large scan. That's going to take a long, long time. So what they can do is at the optimization stage, they would recognize this because, again, they have statistics. They have... They know how many files you're going to process because everything is, in, is loaded internally. So what they can do is rewrite the query to look like this, where there's now the, on this side, it's sort of split into two parts. There's this path here that does the same work as we did before, but this will be using the nodes that, were, that, are, that are in the virtual warehouse that the customer has paid for. But then there's this other portion of the query plan here that you can scale out and run on additional, you know, the free pool of additional resources. And then the, what happens is that these, this is like op, uh, optimistic, like you're opportunistic. Like if there's resources available, use it. If not, whatever, I'll just, I'll just process it over here. But what they do is because, actually, I, don't, I forget the reason why they do this. Um, but what will happen is this thing runs on some other, other uh, machine other, other nodes that aren't in your, in your virtual warehouse. But then instead of just sort of, they can't store the results locally because these are ephemeral nodes, right? So let's say this guy here, like it's, you get to this group I, it produces some results, and let's go back and, and you know, come back around and do the next, next scanning. It can write those results to its local disk because that worker node's not going away because it's assigned to your virtual warehouse. In this case here, you're running on some arbitrary nodes temporarily, and so it'll run maybe your, your query now, but then like a second later it's going to run somebody else's query. So there's no guarantee that your local storage is going to be there. So instead, what it'll do, it, it adds this little insert uh, operator above here. So it materializes the result out to the shared disk storage. Uh, and, then, and then the query plan will scan it as if it was a, 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 you know, as if it was a regular table. Yes? Okay, so, the, so you're talking about broadcast join versus shuffle join, which is different than this flexible right, computing. Right, right. So your original question is, how do they support shuffle joins? Right. Uh, 
again, like they, they can, they are using the local disk as a cache. So you could spill, like if, if, the, if you're doing a shuffle join and you have to spill to disk, you would try to spill to your local disk first, right? And then, and then if you need to send those results to somebody else, well, you read it back in and send it out. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, I'm missing. I'm, I'm like in, in the sense that it's not, it's not a distributed fashion. Like it's not. There's no like, 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 like. Sorry, I, like when you do a join, like are you not to like distribute it on part, the partitioning on a key. Yeah, like there's. You, no, uh, you do. Why, why wouldn't you? Yes, it's a it's a distributed database. So yes, okay. it's basically the same thing we talked about before, right? Like when, but it was a single node. Same thing. I I I hash on the join key, and then I know how to shuffle things, move things around as needed. And they'll do the same stuff. Like they recognize that if one table is really small and one table is bigger, I'll take the small one and broadcast that around so everyone has a, a complete copy of it, right? Otherwise, they do complete shuffle on the join key so that you know all the data from partition A goes to one node, all the data from partition B goes to another node, and I can do recursive partitioning if my if if things are skewed. All the same tricks still work. It's just they're not doing they're not doing shuffle explicitly after every stage the way the way Dremel does and the way Spark does. Now this is completely different. Right? Again, this is just saying that there's this sort of fragment of, of the query plan that I'm going to run this on machines that I'm not directly paying for or provisioned. And because it, I can't rely on its local uh, disk cache, because it'll get blown away once my job is done, they're going to write the results out to, uh, to to disk storage as if it was a file, load, you know, a data loaded in as a regular table, and then this operator then just scans from it. They also talk about how you could potentially start using uh, using these intermediate results for as a query cache. So if you ever see this this you know this fragment again, because you've written out the storage, you could have the, the optimizer figure out, okay, well I've already materialized you know this pipeline. Let me go just read that instead of actually doing the whole the whole process again. I don't know how often this kicks in. I don't know like what, you know, is it like every query gets this or is it some queries? I, I, again, that's all proprietary. That's all internal. And Snowflake doesn't say how often this happens. And I, don't, I don't even know whether you can see this as the user through the UI. Like whether you would know your query got, got the, the flexible compute stuff. All right. So in the paper you, you guys read, they talk about how uh, you know, in the early days of Snowflake, they were trying to decide what should the storage layer actually look like. And again, flashback to 2012, Hadoop and HDFS was the hot thing. That's the way you had scalable, cheap uh, uh, storage. And what they decided was that, or the, the, the trade-off that they're trying to decide is should they build on something HDFS, should they build their own proprietary storage layer, or should they rely on the, the cloud storage from Amazon, in particular Amazon S3. And they talk about the obvious trade-offs is that S3 is, is, is going to be slower than, than local disk, um, not just because of the latency, the round trip, which I think is on average, what, 50, at least 50 milliseconds, if not more. Um, could be up to like 300 milliseconds. It, it, it can be variable. Um, but there's also higher CPU overhead of making these calls because it's not, a, it's, you know, it's not like NVMe where you can bypass the kernel, go get directly to the storage device, and bring it back in with low, low CPU overhead. Like you're literally making a REST call over HTTPS, which means it gets encrypted, going down through TCP IP, sending that over the network, you know, getting it gets resolved back, and then you got to parse it when, it when it comes back in. So the the not the latency is is higher, plus also the CPU cost of of doing doing IOs is higher as well. Now you probably don't remember this, but at the beginning of the semester, I think the second lecture, I mentioned that uh, there's another OLAP system called Yellow Brick, uh, where they saw similar issues, and they basically re rewrote wrote their own uh, S3 yeah their own S3 client doing kernel bypass, right? Instead of using the one Amazon gives you. I don't know if the Snowflake does the same thing, uh, but you can imagine uh, you can imagine that like you you know you if you have the money the Snowflake has, you would write a lot, rewrite a lot of stuff yourself. But obviously, if you you don't want to write the whole entire storage layer because Amazon does a really good job of um, of making sure it's durable and and and, and always available, right? That you don't have to maintain yourself. Let Amazon do that, because at economies of scale, they can do it better and cheaper than anybody else can. 
So the other thing Pink may say is like, although this part sucks, you, it actually is okay for what we want to do in OLAP workloads because we don't actually need to read the entire file every single time. Right? Essentially what's going to happen is for these queries, we know what comms they're going to access because it's, it's, it's SQL, it's declarative, we know what they want to do. So we can just go get the, the offsets of the headers from these different files. In the case of Parquet, it's the footer, but the same idea. And we go figure out where, what portions of the file we need. And things like S3 support doing lookups on objects by, uh, with, with offsets. Right? So they decided that instead of building, re, you know, trying to make HDFS work, which was the right idea because HDF, you know, HDFS is still common, but like it's not the default choice anymore for, for large-scale storage. Um, that instead of trying to build their own storage layer or use the HDFS, that instead they were going to spend their engineering time building a better caching layer on these local disks to amortize and hide the costs of, of doing lookups on S3. And that's, that's something that's very different than, than what Dremel and, and the, the Spark SQL paper talks about, right? So the query operators will be able to spill to local disk. Uh, if necessary, they can also spill to S3. Um, but again, all that's transparent to, to, to the user as writing SQL. Right? They, they handle all this under the underneath the covers. So it's, it's, this, it's this interesting dynamic where the better Snowflake gets at caching and avoiding having to do S3 lookups, uh, the, the cheaper cost for them to run the service, they make more profit off of people because you know, the customers still pay the same amount. If they can reduce their lookups to S3, then they're paying less to Amazon. So it makes them better. But then it also makes the query run faster too. So it's a win-win for everybody. So as I said, beginning Snowflake started off with the, with, with the and actually still is the case that the, 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 the default choice of the, the most of the data is going to be stored in their internal format that they designed, uh, which at a high level looks, I've been told, looks somewhat similar to Parquet. Um, not exactly the same. Um, a little, I think it's, it's slightly it's in between Parquet and Oracle in terms of complexity. This is my understanding, but this is just this is just anecdote uh, from students that worked there and other things. So it's their own proprietary format. They're going to take any table and they're going to break it up into uh, to what they call micro partitions. It's basically 50 to 500 megabytes of data before it gets compressed. That's how they're going to sort of segment things. All right, and once it gets compressed down, on average, about 16 megabytes per file. So again, this is just packs. Because it's running on S3, they're immutable. So anytime I need to make a change, uh, you know, I have to re rewrite the file out, uh, and then update my metadata to say, here's the new version of a file. One thing they do that's different than, uh, than Dremel and in Photon or Spark SQL is that in the background, they're going to be, they have this background service that's going to go through and automatically uh, rewrite micropartitions multiple times to recluster them, reorganize them based on the query access patterns. So you could have, you could define a clustering key on, on a table, and S Snowflake's going to try to figure out what's the right boundaries for that, if I sort the data, what's the right boundaries for these different, uh, uh, you know, for that, on, that, on that key for the different micropartitions. The idea here is that you can, if you pre-sort the data, obviously, there's a bunch of optimizations you can do by figuring out what things you need to read without having to do a complete sequential scan. And then that reduces the, uh, the amount of IOs you have to do. So it seems like it'd be very wasteful that like, I'm going to read a file in, uh, you know, re reorganize it or resort it and change the boundaries and then write it back out. The reads aren't going to be that bad because, again, it will be mostly absorbed by the local cache. But then the writes are going to be better. Yes, you, you pay for the writes to go out, but then that's going to help you on when you, if you assume most of your queries are going to be read only, which in their case it will be because it's OLAP system. You, you know, you'll get fewer reads when you run queries, which is the primary thing you're trying to optimize for. So you're paying a little cost to do the writes to do the, to do the reclustering, but then you get a win for making the queries run faster and read less data. Again, all of this is uh, all, all of this is internal. Other than defining what the clustering key is, the the user just doesn't have to kick any of, the, any of these things off. Again, we'll see in a second how they then also expand upon this to support uh, parquet files or external files. 
So like in the Dremel paper, they talk about how uh, it's very important to support semi-structured data. Right? People have a bunch of random JSON or XML files that they want to dump in your database and start running queries on it. So to handle this, they supported or added support for three data types that are, are unique to Snowflake. I don't, I, I mean, they're not exactly, there's different versions of these things in, in, in different database systems, but there are, the way I'm going to describe here is specific to Snowflake. So variant is basically a JSON blob or some kind of uh, on semi-structured data. And then arrays and objects are just uh, restrictions of that. An array would be semi-structured data, but only as an array of a given data type. An object is a, is, a, is a mapping. So unlike in Dremel, uh, where you had to give the schema of the JSON document ahead of time, right? because you, you would define things in these protocol buffers. You would say, here's, here's, the, here's the schema of the thing I'm actually going to store. Then based on that, they could do what's called what we call the shredding method, where they would break it up and try to store it as, as columnar data. In, in the Snowflake world, they're not going to do that. And instead, they're going to, because uh, they assume people aren't going to be able to give them the schema. And they're going to try to figure out what the schema is or what the data types are for these different fields on the fly automatically as you load the data in. And this is different than what Photon did or what Spark does. Right, Spark had the same problem. Well, they all have the same problem with these JSON things. But like, here's a bunch of data files. I don't know what's in them. And in the case of uh, Photon, what they would do is they would do that batch level adaptivity to try to figure out as I'm actually running the query to change what primitive I'm, I'm, I'm going to use to do different different operations based on what data type I think I'm seeing or the system thinks it's seeing. Right. So like, again, if I have a string and then I'm, I'm seeing, oh, I'm doing basically converting it to a, to a date and then doing some kind of date operation, they would have an optimized version that could take a string and convert it to a date type instead of like, you know, running the sort of random function of this. Again, in Snowflake, they don't want to pay the penalty of doing that conversion at, at query time, so they're going to do it at write time. So again, you start loading up some JSON data. They're going to figure out the fields after, after you see a little bit, and they'll start inferring what the type, type is. And if they identify things like, oh, I, I, there's a, some field in my JSON document that looks like this, day, you know, year hyphen month hyphen hyphen day, oh, and then I'm going to assume that field going to should really be a date type. So then they will automatically parse and convert that into the binary representation of the the date data type. So it's going from a string here to a, a four byte date. But they always maintain or retain the original string version of these of this data so that if, it, if you ever get it wrong, the system gets, you realize later on the prediction was wrong, you can always go back to the original data. Right? If someone does something weird and stupid, like you know, put a, you know, a poop emoji in here instead of uh, the date, then you'd parse that and realize it's not really a, it's a malformed date, but you can still go back and get, get the original one. Right? So again, they're doing this when, when you load the data. Again, under the original model of Snowflake, where you don't support external files, you're only reading, you know, you have to load things in and you parse it and put it into the proprietary format. So that's why they can do this conversion. I don't know how they handle external tables. I think they just do the fallback method. So now again, you can start to see these different design decisions, uh, uh, the different differences between the different systems. Like at a high level, you think, oh yeah, they're, you know, Photon and, and, and Dremel and, and Snowflake, they're all vectorized engines, but it's the nuances that are going to be slightly different. I'm not saying this parsing thing is a huge, huge game changer versus one workload versus another, uh, but you can start to see now what are the, the, the nitty gritty detail, what, what how these things uh, can vary. And I would say going back in the case of the Dremel world, because they were dealing with internal data originally at, at at Google, where everything was mostly written in protocol buffers, so they had the schema, so that's why they can make the choice that way. Whereas in Snowflake, they said, okay, well. I don't, want to, I don't want to pay the penalty at read time because I want my queries to run fast, so I'll pay the penalty of parsing this at runtime. And then in the Spark world, uh, in, in, since Photon and Spark SQL, does, they don't have a, their own proprietary format. They only run on the open source formats. They have to then do the batch level activity stuff, that, that, they, that how, you know, how they support it because they're seeing things for the first time. All right, for the consistent hashing stuff we talked about before, again, uh, consistent hashing is just a way to do basically a hash map where if I add or remove 
uh, entries in the hash map uh, of, of doing my mapping from data to nodes. I don't have to rebalance. I can just reshuffle things along, along the ring. Um, so this hash map is going to be made internally as, uh, uh, with transactional guarantees to ensure that the worker nodes always know what node is responsible for a given file. So there's never any question of like, there's never any, any consistent issues of like, okay, where two, two worker nodes think they're both responsible for the same file. This consistent hash map uh, technique is always going to tell you exactly who, who's responsible for it. And then now if I add new nodes and I need to, in my virtual warehouse, I need to re rebalance, I don't have to shuffle everything around. Uh, I only have to move data from the, from you know, wh wherever in my ring that I've added the new one, whatever comes after me, and I send some portion of my files down, down to or over to that other worker node. And this ensures now that, again, as workers come and go, you don't have to completely invalidate your local cache because the what node is responsible for what file or micro, micro partition file changes as, as, the, as the, the virtual warehouse changes. Right, because again, they're trying to avoid doing lookups on S3 as much as possible. So th this, this would solve that problem. All right, for the query optimizer, it's a, it's a cascades model doing top-down optimization. Uh, again, there's not a lot of public information on exactly what they're doing. Um, but I will say, sometimes in, their, in the Snowflake literature, I, I forget what the, doc, what the documentation says. They will refer to as what we've been calling the query planner, query optimizer. We'll call it as the query compiler. That's a remnant, again, of, of, the, of the vernacular people used for databases in the 1970s. Thinking of, like, again, in the same way that I would compile C into machine, machine code, I would compile my SQL query into the, the machine code of the database system. So, so people historically have used the term compiler, but nowadays the most common, more common phrase is the query optimizer. So the big thing that they care about, again, is trying to figure out what data they don't, they don't have to read. So they're very aggressive on trying to figure out how to prune and skip micropartition files even before the query even starts running. Right? Because again, they want to avoid the lookups on S3 or pressure on the, on the local caches. And then this, once they sort of figure this out, they can then determine what will be the complexity amount of work being done for for the, at least for the query fragments, at least the lower portions of the query plan. Obviously, as you go up, you have to do selectivity estimations, which they, which they try to do like everyone else does because they have, uh, they have some statistics, but not, not very aggressive. Um, not, not very sophisticated statistics, and we'll see in the next slide. But they're going to try to then, that's when they make the decision, OK, well, I think this portion of my query plan is going to be take much longer than, than I normally should or normally would for this virtual warehouse. So that's when they can then decide whether to employ the, the flexible compute uh, scale out. Snowflake supports query plan hints. Uh, they have an online tool where you, you, can, you can muck around with the query plan and change stuff. And then they have some support for runtime a a adaptivity. The th there's always the example they always show of, of whether you do a push down the group by before or after the hash join. That's the example they love, they love to talk about. I don't know if there's any other technique that, that they support. The group by push down below the, the, the hash join. Dremel supports that. I don't know whether uh, Spark SQL does. I don't know whether they can reorder join orders. I don't know, I don't know whether they can change what, what, you know, the, what join plan to do or switch from, from broadcast join to shuffle join. That part, again, I, I didn't see any documentation about it. So as I was sort of saying before that like, Snowflake always wants to try to put things in their own proprietary format, try to get some, you know, some statistics about them. But the kind of statistics they're going to maintain is not going to be as sophisticated as a sort of a monolithic shared everything system like a Postgres, or MySQL, or Oracle. Right? So the only statistics they're going to compute are, are going to be basic zone maps, min-max values for columns within each micropartition. They're not going to compute any histograms. They're not going to compute any, any sketches. And the idea here is that because those things always are horribly wrong and the data could get out of sync very quickly, they, they said, we're just going to avoid all of that. And that means for join order, they're going to do basic uh, heuristic to figure out uh, you know, where, you know, what should join get joined with what. And they claim it works reasonably well for, for what they need. The statistics they're maintained is going to be hierarchical. 
So within a table, you have some statistics, and then from the, the micropartitions, you would have some statistics, and then within the micropartitions for the columns, you'd have some statistics. So table, number of rows, size and bytes, compression information, but then the columns is basically where the zone map stuff is. Okay, min max on a column, uh, the number of, of null values you would have, and the number of distinct values you would have as well. And again, this is enough for them to figure out, to do, to, to do some early pruning before you even start running. The challenge, though, with pruning is how do you actually evaluate uh, expressions to figure out what you don't need, right? So assume I have this table here, and I have, I have these queries on, on these columns. So for things that, like, if it's column equals something, obviously a min-max would, would, would be able to print out a bunch of stuff. But if you start to have expressions like column, plus, column 1 plus column 2 is greater than some number, you know, you in order to be figured out, okay, what I, you know, what is the thing actually going to resolve to, I have to then play with this and actually maybe evaluate it, uh, this expression on per micropartition to figure out what's, what's going to actually be in there or not, right? Or even more complicated here, I'm, com I'm converting the, the, some date field or creation timestamp, extracting out the year, so find me all the entries where, uh, you know, where the, the year is 2023. Right, the classic trick everyone does with this one is you rewrite this into a between call between beginning of the year and the end of the year. Um, but I mean that's what you would do at runtime. But like if now you're trying to look at these statistics you've collected these micro partitions, you actually need to evaluate these as if it was like actually running a query. And that's that's basically what they do. So they have specialized implementations of the expression evaluators that we normally would use at runtime on the real data as, as you're actually processing them. But they would have variants of them that can operate on uh, the, the statistics you collect within your zone maps that then see whether this thing's going to evaluate to true or not and decide whether you're actually going to need to be able to access the, the micropartition later on. Right? This seems sort of like, how do I say this? This seems like trivial, but it's actually not. It's, it's very hard to do this. Because um, it's like you're trying to infer what the boundaries could be. Uh, but you, then you also have to actually evaluate these expressions. Um, you need to consider things like the null indicators, like you know, column plus column, column one plus column two. Well, what if column two could be null? What does that mean? Well, I probably should look at the, the entire market partition. I can look at the zone map and or the null count, tell me whether any column is actually even going to or any value within a column is going to be null. That can tell me whether I need to look at it. Um, but these are all the consider considerations you have to make. And again, you don't want to use, you can't use the implementation you would have for the, for when you're actually processing tuples. You basically need a whole other expression evaluation engine to do this directly on, on the statistics. We had the, the, the MySQL guys gave a talk, again, during the pandemic, and they talked about in their, in their query optimizer for some, some queries where like you would have, like subqueries you would have like a constant in there. They would actually stop query execution run that subquery on the database system itself, get back the constant value, and then substitute that back into your query optimizer, which just seems kind of crazy if you think about it. Like, for one query, I'm going to invoke another query to run my query, even though it's not like it's, uh, that, make, that makes sense. This is essentially what they're doing, but rather than doing the MySQL way, where you say, all right, well, I don't, I'm not going to have a so separate code base that can express, you know, evaluate these expressions without having to go look at the database. Uh, sorry, they're, instead of having a, MySQL doesn't have a separate execution engine to do these sort of mini evaluations for during optimization time. They just ask the data system to do it for them and get back a result as if it was a regular query being sent by the client. What they're trying to do is just evaluate these things uh, without having to fire up the full engine. Because right? you're doing this in, the, in what they call the cloud services layer, not on the worker nodes themselves. Okay. So that's a quick, you know, quick rush about what Snowflake is, uh, does. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, 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 the fight, the dust up, whatever you want to call it, between Databricks and Snowflake that happened in 2021 that I talked about a little bit up at the, at the end of the last class. So again, remember the, in the Databricks paper, and, and, and they had TPCH results, but then there was this paragraph near the end that said, oh, by the way, we also have TPCDS results that have been validated and audited by the, the Transaction Processing Council, the, the nonprofit that runs run TPC. 
and you know, we're the fastest. So they had a blog article that came out in November in 2021 you know, that talks about the paper talk, and it talks about setting the new world record on doing uh, 100 terabytes uh, TPCDS run. But then they also had this little piece here. You know, they talk about like, you know, wh why it's important to get this audited, how, how the, you know, the, the fastest, yada, yada, yada. But then they also had this little piece here that says uh, where some researchers at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center also ran a sort of subset of or what they call the, the, the power run of TPCDS, um, so sort of a more, more restrictive version of it that doesn't, doesn't do everything um, to get the full auditing approval, but like it's, it looks like TPCDS. That they ran a, a comparison between Databricks and Snowflake and then found that Databricks was uh, two times faster than Snowflake at 12 times the lower cost, right? Sure, okay, that's fine. Um, so again, they put out this, this blog article and they had this, this graph here, right? Well, a week, two weeks later, the Snowflake guys saw that. They didn't like that. So these are the two French guys. These are the two Oracle guys that I mentioned. This is, these guys don't have the tattoo. It's, the, it's Marcin's got the tattoo. Um, so Snowflake comes back and says that the Databricks numbers are junk, uh, that the, the cost is higher because they're running on the enterprise version of Snowflake, which they charge more for. Uh, but there's no materialized views you would use in TPCDS. So they could run the standard edition, and it should be a lower cost. Um, and that when they run the, the same experiment, supposedly, that the Barcelona guys run, that they're twice as fast as what, what Databricks is, is showing in this graph here. right? Uh, and, and in this blog article, they tell people how to log in to Snowflake, and like in four clicks, you can rerun and validate the experiments from uh, that, that they did to showing that how, you know, they're not as slow as Databricks claims, right? Okay, that's fine. Well, Databricks came back three days later, uh, and they said that, uh, that the Snowflake people are, are all bunk, um, that they still stand by their, their results that they showed here, um, and that if you rerun Snowflake's experiments, or rerun the experiments that Snowflake ran, but not using what they call the pre-baked or the prepared version of the data files of the, the TPCS data set. If you don't use their prepared version, then you get the results that the Barcelona guys originally were reporting, where it, they're 2x slower than, uh, than Databricks. Right? So here's what the Barcelona guys claim over here. This is what Snowflake says in their blog article that they can get on their version of running TPCDS. And then this is what, this is what Databricks got if you then load up the, the official data set from TPCDS, install it into Snowflake manually, um, and this is what Databricks claims that they can get with, with Photon, right? So uh, the reason, in, in, in the, the Databricks article, the reason why they say that there's a discrepancy between what Snowflake claims they can get versus what if you just use the official data set and load it into TPCDS is that this file, you know, the data set here, the, the, what they call the pre-baked version, that's like the, the clustered sort of stuff that I talked about before, where you let that automatic thing run to rebalance the micropartitions in such a way uh, that's optimized for the query access patterns. If you do that, then you get the better results. If you just bulk load it, uh, then you know, without doing any of those optimizations, this is what you get. And that with the, with the, to get official TPCDS uh, results, you have to account for that data preparation time or the maintenance time or the setup time in your, in your analysis, right? Whereas in this case here, uh, you know, this could have ran for 12 hours for them to compress down and, and sort everything up, so now the queries run fast. But they're not reporting that in, in their times, right? So who's right? Well, uh, I want to be the Switzerland of databases. I, I like everybody. Uh, I will say also, too, um, both the co-founder of Databricks and the co-founder of Snowflake are investors in my startup. Um, but uh, I'll have to cut this. Did Snowflake respond to that? No, I, I, as far as I know, Snowflake didn't come out with a blog article after, after the Databricks uh, thing. And the thing sort of blew over because of the holidays, whatever. Um, well, sorry, this? The, like Correct. Yes, yes. So his comment is the Snowflake numbers are audited. Or sorry, the Databricks numbers are audited by by TPC, right. with a third party old guy that, that checked it. Right. right. 
Whereas this is just like, okay, we, we ran it, here's, you know, here it is. But then they also claimed like, you can, go, you can go run it yourself and see the results. But the point is like, if they wanted to have an even match, they'd also have to get their results more than Co that. Correct. If, like, this is what I was saying, was saying in the last class. Like, to your point, yes, if you want to have a true apples to apples comparison and say it's audited by TPC, TPC you have to, Snowflake would have to do what Databricks did. Right. Is it worth it? I would say no, right? <laughs> Like, again, this is fun for memes, but like, is this, uh, in the end, does it matter? Um, so, uh, Reynolds did send, Databricks did send me a text afterwards that like, for them, this was a big win because this sort of changed the narrative of what Databricks was meant for. You now saw that as a, as a competitor to Snowflake as a data warehouse. Whereas maybe prior to this, because Spark SQL was pretty, uh, you know, pretty slow and pretty primitive, um, compared to Photon, that, you know, th th for them, this was a game changer. Yes? Did you have the slide when Snowflake sponsored this? Did I have this slide when Snowflake sponsored? Snowflake sponsored in 2018. So this is 2021. This is during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, again, there's a long history of, of different database vendors uh, shooting each other, sh shooting at each other uh, about benchmark numbers. There's a, bunch, there's a couple of ones about time series databases more recently, too, as well. Um, and then Mongo always famously had amazing benchmark results, and then you realize, okay, you know, it's everything. No, nothing is persistent. Nothing is durable, right? Because when you in the old version of MongoDB, when you would do a write, you would, you would get back an acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement wasn't, oh, we got your write and we saved it on disk. Your, the acknowledgement was, hey, we got your packets. They didn't actually you didn't actually run the query, do anything yet. So then you had to send another request to see did my did my change actually make it to disk, right? But like all their benchmark numbers looked amazing because it was like, hey, it was like almost like a ping back and forth. <laughs> um, it, what's nice about the new some of the new distributed SQL systems like Cockroach, Yugabyte, uh, Fauna, um, um, Planet Scale is that you know they take strong consistency or transactional guarantees. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very important design concept, and like out of the box they provide these things. Whereas, yes, MongoDB sorts transactions now, but they you know. They progress to get there. Now, from a you know sitting in ivory tower in academia, I can claim, oh yeah, that you, know, you should be doing transactions, of course. But like, if you're a business and you're trying to get your thing out the door, like, you I could see the advantage of not doing the hard stuff right away and doing the things that people maybe immediately notice, like the you know getting up and running quickly, having a nice UI or nice 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 user experience. And then get the traction, get the product actually working, are people actually using it, and then fill in the pay off that technical debt later on. My SQL did that in the late '90s, early 2000s. Like my ISM was a shit, shit engine; they did new transactions. You could lose data. Eventually, they got InnoDB, and, and that fixed things. MongoDB, same thing. Right? So you can claim new new 4J is basically doing the same thing as well. Um, so you know, people, people, history repeats itself. All right, so I want to finish up talking about a few additional things. So again, like, like Databricks, like Dremel, if you don't have statistics, uh, if you want to be able to operate on files that aren't in your, in your database that you didn't store, you don't, have good, you don't have any statistics, and you need a way to figure out how to, how to figure, you know, what's going on, figure out what's going on. Uh, so again, Snowflake originally required all users to load things into the priority format before they be queried. But since then, they've, since the paper you guys read, they've expanded to support additional methods for ingesting data. Snowpipe is basically a way to use S S Snowflake as a Kafka endpoint. So you, you can do streaming updates, and they, they, uh, they store everything using or send data as, a, as Apache Arrow. But I'll talk about how, how they support external tables, at least, at least for using Iceberg, which I'll talk about in a second. And then Hybrid Tables is their transactional engine that came out in 2022. So, Parquet files themselves, it's just, it's just the format of the file. It tells you what's in the file. But there's additional context that you want to have about how that file relates to other files that could, you could use for speeding up query execution. So in particular, this pruning thing. Like if I know I'm doing a query that's going to look up data within some date range, I'd like to know what files have that date range. And ideally, I want to be able to do that without having to go maybe peek inside the file. Right, the catalog is, you know, I can do a look up the catalog, find me all the files in this, this date range. So that's sort of the expression evaluation that, that we just talked about.
But again, Parquet by itself doesn't have that. So the way people sort of uh, half-assed it or like did it themselves is that oftentimes the like literally the directory name would tell you what you know what partition what what date range a file was in, right? Like I'd have my directories be like you know data slash twenty twenty three slash April slash and then you know some date, and then you could have a you would have to have additional code to then look at the directory names to figure out what files I want to read, right? That was a very com that's a very common uh, uh, sort of I don't want to say design pattern, but it's a very common uh, scheme that people implement. So with Iceberg, the idea is that okay, well instead of people just putting willy nilly files on and then trying to figure out what the the information or metadata about it from directory names, let's treat it as a uh, let's treat this metadata as a as a first class entity, and now have a service of itself that can can tr keep track of what files that I have. It's essentially the same thing that. Snowflake built internally in our catalog services, but now here's something that can be reused for Spark and 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 Dremio and 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 all these other uh, these data data lake engines that people are query engines that people are building. So that's what Iceberg is. It's basically a way to keep track of the partition information, the versioning, the schema information or schema schema changes of a bunch of Parquet files. So for Snowflake, the as support in 2021, be able to ingest. Uh, metadata from 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 Iceberg, uh, as well as creating and writing it out, and then querying Iceberg files in 2021. So that gets around that problem that that they would have, where you got to you got to load everything into the proprietary format. There's enough of a, a match between what Iceberg maintains and what what Snowflake maintains internally, so that they can they can directly query on top of these things. I think they also announced a preliminary support for Delta Lake. The thing from from Databricks, where you can you can basically same idea, where you, you can have this this storage interface to, to do incremental updates, and eventually spits out Parquet files. Yeah, you, you can do the same thing now. Uh, there's early support to do the same thing with with in Snowflake as well. The other thing you do now with Snowflake too is as support for doing transactions. And so again, Snowflake always supported transactions. They talk about how they have in the paper how they have snapshot isolation because you're doing transactions on the, the key value store to, to, as, you do, as you make schema changes or make changes to the database system. But you wouldn't really want to run like you know your, your website that's doing you know ingesting new orders or running a message board off of uh, off of Snowflake the original OLAP engine. It's, it's just simply not designed for that. So in 2022, last year, they announced support for uh, building a uh, what they call a Unistore, which is a uh, I don't want to say it's a, I don't want to say the database system because essentially it's a service within the Snowflake ecosystem that allows you to run operat operational workloads or OLTB workloads on directly inside Snowflake. So the way it works is that you declare a table as being a hybrid table, and it's going to have a, a row portion and, and a column portion. The row portion it will be a like a log structured storage area. And then there's a background process that occasionally is going to look at them, look at the data, and write it to uh, the, the internal columnar format that, that Snowflake uses. This looks a lot like the Delta Lake stuff we saw in, 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 in Databricks. Same idea. Right? But, but in the case of Unistore, I think you can do SQL transactions on SQL, whereas Delta Lake, I think it's just like a, it's a simple CRUD API. So now your OLAP queries can, that you can run on these, t these hybrid tables. The system is going to know, okay, depending on what you know, what data I want to see, how fresh I want to I want to have data, I can I'll, I'll go retrieve whatever data I need from the row store and merge it with any any intermediate results or results I'm generating from the the column store portion of, of the table. And all of this is again is transparent to, to the end user. Okay, so the building a transactional database system is hard. Extremely hard, uh, and Snowflake got this up pretty quickly. How did they do it? I can't tell you. But they have another database called Foundation DB that they use internally. That is a transactional key value store. That is very robust. That you could use it for things. Uh, and so Foundation DB was was. The paper doesn't say. I think I don't actually. I don't remember the paper says it explicitly, but they use Foundation B explicitly for the catalog service. The catalog service has to be transactional, it has to be durable, but it's not. It's not a column store information. It's it's a row store. 
So they use Foundation DB for the doing all the transactions internally for you know when files get added, when new nodes get added, when, when nodes go down and so forth, right? Right? Any any schema changes that occur. All this is being stored in, in Foundation DB. My understanding is that they would have uh, they wouldn't have one Foundation DB cluster or sort of instance per virtual warehouse. You would have it sort of they would have multiple they would have one Foundation DB instance, which could be multiple nodes, service multiple virtual warehouses across different customers. Right? Because you know the amount of load you're putting on this thing, it's it's not as high as like you know, sc scanning data or running all workloads. So they were using Foundation B in the very beginning in 2012, 2013. Again, when you're designing a system, with, you know, in the same way that they didn't have to worry about how you're going to build a storage layer, let Amazon handle S3. Now you don't have to worry about how am I going to handle my transactional catalog. They just relied on found, found, Foundation DB to use it. But then uh, Foundation B was closed source. Apple bought them in 2015. And they basically, the company ceased to do any operations for any external customers. Now their only customer was Apple. So, but that's a problem. <laughs> now you're this huge, you know, by 2015, Snowflake is, is, is becoming huge. You know, the key, this key component of your system now has been bought by, not really a competitor, but like some other tech company. What do you do? Well, they told me that they had the, the source code in escrow service. That in the event that Foundation got, got bought, they would have access to the source code. So when, when Foundation B got bought in 2015, they then got the source code they could then maintain internally and expand upon and use, keep using in Snowflake. But then in 2018, Apple announced, oh, we're going to open source a Foundation DB. Now, I think they're part of either the cloud, whatever, the cloud native foundation or the Apache, or made, made Apache foundation. Snowflake then had to go merge a bunch of the stuff that they've built over the three years since, since Apple acquired them. They had to merge that back into, uh, into uh, to the open source foundation to be because they, they 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 get still the development of this. So Snowflake is a database company. They they spend a lot of time building the the core OLAP engine, but there's actually a, a pretty sizable team at Snowflake that actually works on Foundation DB. So the two main uh, developers of Foundation DB are going to be people at Apple, and and people at Snowflake. But for legal reasons, the Snowflake guys can't commit things to the, the to Foundation DB source code. They have to send a Slack message to somebody at Apple to get, go do it for them, right? Which because of lawyers, which is always always a problem. Anyway, so uh, Foundation B is an interesting system. I won't. Obviously, we're not focusing on this in this class, but one of the things they they, they did give a talk with us, uh, you know, it's on YouTube a few few years ago as well. One of the things that is very fascinating about Foundation B, which is much different than how people build other people build database systems, is that they. Instead of building the data system first, they build a simulator of the database system first. And that way they can inject uh, failures and, fault and check the fault tolerance and robustness and resiliency of the, of the system itself in, in a simulated environment, like stress testing to see whether a node fails, what happens. And then they can it's potentially a way to verify that the implementation is actually correct for different corner cases of fair scenarios. And that ensures that it's super reliable, which of course, again, you, you, want, you, want, your, you want your transactional system to be very reliable. And that's, that's the way they test it. OK. All right, so to finish up. So Snowflake is a, is a very interesting system. They laid the what I call the roadmap of how to build a successful uh, cloud database as a service company um, <coughs> that's trying to be you know, replicated by a bunch of these different startups. <coughs> but they, they, they got there first. Um, and, it, and then I would say that the, you know, the main competitors in this space are going to be Microsoft, Snowflake, Amazon, uh, and, and Google BigQuery. And then all these other people that have raised a lot of money, these other startups, they're trying to be, get to that Snowflake level. And I would argue that uh, Snowflake got there first, and it's going to be very hard to beat because they have so much, uh, you know, so much traction already. <clears throat> and they, they have a head start on, on everyone else. So. Although there's a not, not a lot of information that's available about how, how their, their internal system works, I mean, Snowflake has given a bunch of talks with us um, at CMU. They're giving a talk next week at the, at the intro class uh, as well. Uh, so you can kind of get bits and pieces about how they do certain things from these talks or even, you know, like I said, calling a sheesh, but that's not an option for everyone. Um, 
but I think there's still a lot of things about that that publicly talk about, oh, we can do this, and it's interesting, but it's not really clear how they actually do it. Um, and I would argue that the, the database guys do a bit uh, a better job publishing than, uh, than the other ones. Again, I, I think it's a byproduct of them coming out of Berkeley. So there's other things. Like, so, so one thing I actually don't know, and I asked them, like you can kind of get the, again, it's still state of the art, but there's still, you kind of, you can kind of see how it was designed for a different time, even though it was 10 years ago, not that long, right? But in tech world, that, 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 that is actually a long time, right? Because people sort of think about databases differently 10 years ago than we think about them now. In particular, this idea of the data lake, right? Databricks coming, from, coming out, you know, built on top of Spark. You know, like I said, they don't have their own proprietary format. They're going to run on, on these open source formats. And a lot of the systems that are, uh, that are out today are doing the same thing. They may build proprietary indexes to speed things up, but they're going to be mostly running on the open source formats. The other thing they talk about too is like, I actually don't know whether they are running, uh, you know, running containers or Kubernetes, right? They talk about you know, it's a process on a worker node because you assume at the time they were running on you know the bare metal VM. Uh, I, I like to think that over, over time that's been changed, but like you wouldn't build a system like that today. You would everything would be containerized. I'm assuming that again they fixed this up. Just, I haven't seen anything public about it. So I think, again, it just just to show you that, like, I mean, especially in databases, things change really fast. And what seems like sort of state of the art will, will be antiquated, you know, within five, 10 years. And Snowflake is still state of the art, but you, can just, you, see, you start to see remnants of it. And again, I'm not saying they're going to fail, uh, or like, because, you know, because it was designed 10 years ago instead of eight years ago or five years ago. Um, but you know, over time, it's, it's very hard to change these things, and especially at their scale. Although, you know, if you're cloud service, you, you can hide all that. But if it was on-prem, it'd be a nightmare. But anyway, I, I, it's just some random musings. Okay, so next class, Mark is going to come give a guest lecture about DuckDB. So we'll we'll project it here, and we'll we'll sit here. We, we, we can, I'll try to get the owl thing, the the speaker, with the the camera that goes around. Um, and Mark's a great guy. It should be a good talk. Okay? Okay. All right, guys. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the S D Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. You pull me on the cup, so y'all yeah, I'm a I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>